Right, good afternoon. Uh, still alive, I see nobody sleeping, that's a good sign. Um, uh, those who've been here one year before, you know whenever I pop up, uh, there is good news and uh, bad news. Uh, <laughs> one of the news is uh, usually my presentations uh, come up because we had some, not necessarily between EASA, but also internally we had some uh, controversial discussions. Oh, thank you. I feel extremely well served here. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, in case you have difficulties to hear me, just... Uh, wave your hand. Um, so we have uh, we had um, difficult discussions internally and externally uh, and that's um, basically the two presentations that I have back to back. Um, that's the more difficult news. The good news is uh, in order to go through all the legal and technical details we would probably spend the whole afternoon. So the presentations are quite short and uh, we will focus on uh, on key issues. So that's the content of the presentation already. The title is a bit difficult to read. It's EASA changes embedded in non-EASA approved design. Um, uh, of course, as usual, I know better now how to present the topic. So I skip one slide to which I will come back and show you first of all um, the overview. Uh, we have a type certificated product. Uh, we have very often STCs on top of that. Um, and some of them are not necessarily ASA approved. Uh, we have aircraft delivered. It could be an Airbus uh, perfectly uh, under uh, EASA type uh, design configuration. And then we have an FASTC on top, uh, happens quite often, uh, a cabin completion. And then uh, for whatever reason, the new the operator changes, they come back to us and they want to have an EASA STC uh, to change that uh, cabin configuration. <clears throat> and that's the yellow marked um, EASA STC. And that, well, necessarily interfaces with the previously non-EASA approved STC. Uh, and there have been uh, two quite extreme positions. One saying, uh, well, no way, uh, the entire product has to comply to the ASA type design. Uh, and others that say, well, whatever is technically feasible, we have no limitation, so let's go ahead. Um, actually, that's now the time to go back uh, to the previous slide. Uh, and um, Michael is uh, still with us. Uh, I think we have coordinated that position uh, with you. And I would put it under recommended reading. I'm not reading it out uh, to you uh, line by line. Uh, but that's basically the fundament why we believe, yes, legally it's possible. Um, under two quite important um, considerations. The considerations are that uh, we cannot only work with compliance on change level, we have to work with compliance on aircraft level. And I will come back with two very simplistic, uh, very generic examples uh, to, to show uh, what we mean with that. Um, we, we have to deal with interfaces that sometimes go into uh, the area of uh, the previously approved uh, or non-EASA approved uh, STC. And there was always the concern, well, what about if this uh, half uh, non-EASA, half EASA approved product wants to be registered in a European member state? Well, we... Um, Theoretically, if you look into the practic uh, practical uh, implications, uh, you could uh, answer that by saying, well, every national authority does not just put the aircraft on their register uh, by virtue of uh, an application. They check what is the actual configuration of the product. Uh, but we, we thought that we can uh, circumvent that concern by simply uh, coming up with a generic limitation to say whenever such a product is to be put on the ASA, uh, uh, as a member state register, a reinvestigation is necessary in a nutshell. Well, now to the examples. Uh, and again, uh, they are overly simplistic. Um, the first one, uh, they are both uh, associated with stretchers. Those of you who have been here before, last year I've presented the Air Medical Services uh, special condition, which also deals with uh, stretchers. Um, I think those examples are practical examples, but again, generalized uh, for demonstration only. The first one is related to direct view. Uh, you have a configuration. Let's assume this uh, configuration is a non-EASA approved um, cabin configuration. So on direct view, we have basically no direct information what 
uh, are the implications for direct view of the cabin attendance of the cabin. We know that a certain percentage is required to be seen directly uh, by the cabin attendance. Uh, here in this example, uh, we have the two aft seats uh, where these two black arrows uh, go away from uh, that are assumed to be uh, used for direct view of this aft section of the cabin of an uh, A330. That's an assumption, uh, and uh, we do not know whether these were the seats that were actually used for the direct view compliance. We do not know whether direct view compliance for this previous STC was uh, marginal, so one seat more or less uh, would already make uh, this um, requirement non-compliant. So therefore, that's typically an assessment which goes into the area of the previously approved uh, STC and compliance across this entire element which affects both the EASA STC and the non-EASA approved S STC are affected. The second one is uh, width of aisle. Uh, we had uh, substantiations uh, for stretcher installations where the question was asked, well, uh, does the stretcher protrude into the aisle and is the aisle then um, a compliant? Uh, or maintains to be compliant with the other requirements? Well, very simple. To start with, uh, if we don't know if uh, the width of aisle was previously compliant to the ASA type design, uh, we cannot say by, well, yes, uh, the stretcher will remain within the envelope of the seats, even under loads, uh, that this is uh, an EASA uh, compliance. So, therefore, again, uh, for this uh, for this particular impact um, or for this particular installation, we had to go a bit beyond and make some measurements to ensure that initially uh, the width of aisle was compliant with uh, the ASA requirements. So I would suggest that uh, you take this back with you in case you ever come up. Uh, it's it's not something that comes up uh, every other day. Uh, we we were working on this question easily for two, three years uh, to come up with this, uh, I go back again uh, with this statement, again recommended reading uh, in case you are affected. Um, with that, um, are there any high level questions? Perhaps we, we move to the next presentation and see afterwards okay. for the questions. Yeah.